So are we all here? You ready to go? Okay. So time to go to work. We had a lot of inspiration to last a lifetime, I'm sure. I hope. Is my hope legitimate? Good. Yes, I heard yes. Good. But let's now go to work. And work means details. So what is the quantum worldview and what is it really telling us? We heard a great speech, by the way. We heard we are God and you are God. That's lofty. That's the wishes of the Upanishad said. Aham Brahmasmi. Sounds great. But of course we ask, but how, why don't I feel it? Why don't I feel the power of being God? So a very important modification that quantum physics gives you is the first lesson that you remember. There is a difficulty to be overcome. We are God, parenthetically, in potentiality. In potentiality. There are great problems to be overcome. And it's not just disease. We have some built-in problems in our brain. When we try to inspire others, we don't usually think of these difficulties. Of course, this is a healing conference, so we should emphasize healing. And we don't emphasize disease. We move from disease dynamics into healing dynamics. That's all very logical, especially for healers. But the healers themselves also have this fundamental disease built into their brain. This is called negative emotional brain circuit. We cannot help it. We are born with it. Anger, jealousy, competitiveness, envy, lust. And there are so many more. So disease is not only a result of external stimuli or just the entropic disassociation of the body with the vital and the mental. But it's more than that. It's also this internal stimuli that continuously bombard us, some of which we suppress because they're so traumatic we don't want to live them. Some of it we go through again and again and do live them again and again and get traumatized that way, that too leaves a mark on us. So what does the quantum worldview really mean to us personally? How can we use it to not only heal in the general sense of when there is really a disease, but also heal ourselves from this continuous bombardment of negative emotional brain circuits that we go through our entire life. This is the challenge. Can the one quantum worldview give us a way of life that will be a rescue from this condition? Human condition is great in potentiality. Human condition is as far as we have come through evolution. It's to be celebrated, but still we have these difficulties to overcome. That's reality. So quantum worldview fundamentally says the first optimistic thing, which is that, yes, we are God and you are God, but potentially. So how do we make the potential actual? That, of course, is the big problem. You know that already. We try to be enlightened. People like Ramana Maharshi knew that he is God. He also knew that you are God. That's a very good stage to reach. Quantum worldview can teach you that right here, right now. I cannot promise it to everyone, but a few of you, 
may get the knowledge so fundamentally, so personally, that you really understand that, yes, we are potentially God. This one can do. Or you can read a book. I've written quite a few and others. And go through the arguments of the quantum physics and you will get it. In the past, we call this Jnana Yoga. To get the essential knowledge, understand the essential knowledge. And the past gurus would teach us, like Patriji, he would teach us. But he's a quantum teacher. So he says, no, I don't teach you. You have to learn it yourself. What does that mean? Now, he can say things like I am saying. I'm sure he says them even better. But what he means is exactly quantum. The understanding has to come within you, which we call a quantum leap. A discontinuous jump from your previous belief system that you are a nothing, you are just a material body, which has this negative emotional brain circuits and gets angry and gets all this survival stuff that we do with each other, competitiveness and all. Instead, you replace it by the understanding that no, you really are potentially God. But it has to come within you. Beautiful teaching, teaching procedure. Thank you. So that's the first lesson of quantum physics. So how do we understand this very simple thing? Listen to it again. Quantum objects are waves of possibility that becomes actual event of our experience when we observe. Notice how we measure the electron. Remember yesterday's experiment? Very simple, electrons, detectors all over the room, Geiger counters. The electron is all over the room, but not every counter goes stick. Only one of them does. And guess what? Unless an observer is present, we really cannot tell if the electron was detected. Very interesting. Because Geiger counter itself is an inanimate object. It too is made of quantum potentiality, just possibility. It cannot be actualized just by itself. So this is the first belief that you have to remove from yourself. Is this really true? Well, mathematically, it is. Quantum mathematician von Neumann proved it as a mathematical theorem. Never doubt it. He showed material interactions can never transform a wave of possibility into an event of actuality. Material interaction, hear me again, material interaction, material forces can never transform a wave of possibility into an event of actuality. What does that mean? That means Geiger counters and cameras and what have you can look at the electron for thousands and thousands of years, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. Ever. That's what it means. Isn't that wonderful to know? That the human being, that sentient being has to be present. Well, not the human being. I mean, we can be a little bit more open. Any living being, let's be at least that much open. So what distinguishes between life and non-life, sentient and non-sentient, this is what distinguishes. Any life is a representation of that divine. Any life is a representation of consciousness. So something in the living cell is special that the Geiger counter does not have. Something in the brain of human beings is very special that certainly a Geiger counter does not have. So the exciting lesson of the morning, right? We are God and you are God in potentiality and we are representations 
of God. That was down the line. That was down the line of what? Probably fourth or fifth of the great things that Lakshmiji and her husband said. Beautiful. Representations. We are representation. So brain has the representation making power of consciousness itself. Somehow brain captures. And in the process, we become sentient I. I looking at you, separate from you. That separateness is real too. So the unity of consciousness that non-locality establishes is obscured. You see that, don't you? In order to have experience, we need an I looking at you. We need a separateness. Consciousness has to divide itself into two, one part looking at the other. Do you see? The ancient teachers call this Maya, illusory. We now are spelling it out. What is Maya? Well, Maya is being created by something in the brain. We have even given a name to it. What creates the Maya that consciousness identifies with the brain? It is now called tangled hierarchy. A simple hierarchical machine is how non-living objects are built. Elementary particles make atoms, make molecules, make cells, make the brain. Molecules also make the Geiger counter. That's the inanimate regime. And then comes the crucial step. Molecules make cells, and that's the crucial step. A living cell can capture consciousness within it. And that's how it becomes alive. Alive meaning the ability of distinguishing between itself and the environment. Alive meaning that it can now also manifest the energies of life, vital energies, prana. And therefore it is alive. It's alive first of all because it's separate from the environment, it perceives itself separate from the environment. That distinction too is important. Ultimately, there is no separateness, but an appearance of separateness has been created. And through what? Through some sort of tangle. This is very important to understand. If it is a simple hierarchy, one building up the other to the other to the other, then we can easily as descend and undo it too. A tangled hierarchy, we cannot undo it. We are completely helpless. We're completely identified with the brain. You see the difficulty? This separateness that you feel, I feel with you, it's legit, it's lawful. There's no way out of it. Ask Portaji, if you ask him, he is enlightened, I'm sure. But will he say that, yes, I see you one with me right now? No, that would be saying, I see God. Nobody can see God. Separate from himself. Because God is in separateness. Get it through your head. This is what quantum physics is saying. God is non-local, in separateness, instantly connected with itself. There is nothing but God. That's the only being there is. This is why we call it ground of being. In this, there are potentialities. And when this consciousness collapses, these potentialities into actuality, it identifies with this tangled hierarchy of the brain, which is so tangled, it's circular. You cannot get out of a circle. So if a hierarchy can be created, which is a circle, and you get caught into it somehow, because you want to collapse its possibilities, you are stuck. And that's what happened to consciousness. And that's why brain can embody consciousness. This is why a living cell can embody 
consciousness. What a miracle. And it is a miracle. Why is it a miracle? Because we can never create that kind of tangle in the laboratory. We cannot do it. Human being can never create, however much they try. You know, the computer people are still hopeful. They think the world is information, they think the world is not consciousness. You can do it all with computers and information processor. That's not what quantum physics says. That's as non-quantum, as unscientific as any other idea that I have heard. It's nonsense. Quantum physics is explicit about it. In the presence of the observer only, there is collapse of the quantum possibility into actuality. So the second lesson then is that in the presence of tangled hierarchy in the brain, in the presence of tangled hierarchy in the living cell, consciousness identifies itself with the circularity of the machine and that's how the machine becomes alive. This is why these living systems are irreducible. You cannot reduce it. If they were built of simple hierarchy, we could reduce them. We could break it down and then reassemble. Like we can break down a car and reassemble it. What happens when you try to do such a thing with a living being? We know, we, we know about dead being. One moment, have you seen somebody dying? I have. One moment, the person is alive. Next moment, the person is dead. What's the difference? Molecules are the same. Exactly the same molecules. No difference. You take the weight, it's exactly the same. What's gone? Consciousness is not embodied anymore. That's what's changed. Consciousness is not collapsing possibility waves into actuality in that brain, in that living cell. Now it's a dead cell, now it's a dead brain. That's the difference. You will say, okay, we now have near-death experience. That's great. Even better news for quantum physicists. Why? Because in near-death experience, what happens is that a person dies, the brain is dead, no EEG recording, all true, but then marvels of cardiology, because the body is still alive, the organs are not dead, the cells are not dead, that takes longer, only the brain is dead. So cardiologists can revive this person. So what happens when 